I think now I can start. Yes, the recording has started. So hello, everyone. Today is September 30th. This is um, another SES update call. The uh, format of this one will be slightly different than the ones that you're maybe used to because um, uh, this is more meant to be uh, a discussion specifically about how we at SES together with um, uh, other like-minded core units can help to um, uh, start transitioning MakerDAO towards the end game plan. That is assuming that the, uh, the MIPS that are currently um, in the freezing period and will soon be up for vote, that they will make it. And um, since it is looking that way, we are uh, already looking to uh, uh, to see how we can help. So I have um, a presentation that I will try to go through uh, pretty quickly, and then um, we'd like to uh, to start the discussion. And very happy to welcome our um, our delegates on stage for this. So Tim and Rafa, uh, Rafael, thank you for um, uh, joining us. Yeah, just reminder, guys, if you have any questions, you can put it in the Q and A. Uh, if you want to. Up on the mic, you can let us know. Uh, we'd love to have you uh, also later for the discussion. But uh, but yeah, go ahead, order. All right. So um, yeah, first I would like to uh, briefly talk about the term decentralized operations. This is uh, a term that we've been using um, to describe this uh, new activity that we would like to get involved in, and are uh, actually already involved in. Um, then. I want to uh, discuss a couple of the steps that we have in mind, how we can support the transition to MetaDAOs on a very practical level. And um, yeah, one uh, thing that I want to talk about is the uh, the idea of uh, project-based budgeting, which uh, Juan has already pitched to you many times before. Um, this is uh, one example that we can take to see uh, how that transition towards these new structures, how that would work. And then, as I said, I'll try to keep it short and open the discussion as uh, uh, as early as possible. If there are any burning questions or comments during the presentation, then also feel free to uh, to interrupt me. So decentralized operations, I um, have uh, started to like this term in favor of uh, governance because, um, yeah, uh, what does it mean? So. Decentralized operations for me, it's the uh, the art of getting things done in an open, transparent, and decentralized organization. And um, by things here, we mean uh, work that actually produces uh, real value. And um, of course, within MakerDAO, we think that, well, isn't that what um, governance is, uh, is doing or uh, is uh, uh, should be doing? And um, that's the reason why I like this term decentralized operations, because DAO governance really doesn't fully cover the full extent of getting things done. DAO, DAO governance is, um, uh, it involves a lot of discussion and uh, hopefully at the end, uh, some consensus and decision making. But once the decision is made, the results are uh, more or less left as is, or at least that is often the impression that people get. And of course, for uh, effective execution, we need more than that. We need governance, we need coordination, and we need uh, the implementation phase as well. And um, that's why we, we like to use the term decentralized operations, because it uh, covers the three aspects and it emphasizes the execution part, which is um, something that we may need as we move from the theoretical principles of the end game plan into uh, uh, practical implementation. So. Um, we uh, have been having discussions about decentralized operations, how to do that for a while. And um, it's now becoming clear how uh, we would be able to support this transition to MetaDAOs um, by offering those decentralized operations. So SES, together with a number of like-minded core units, we um, are uh, planning to form the decentralized operations cluster. If you are a fan of the um, posts that Rune is making on the forum, then I'm sure you know that a cluster is a, um, a group of people who are starting to form a group uh, that can then turn into a MetaDAO later on. So decentralized operations can be offered as um, a product uh, with support services. And why is that important? Well, 
uh, we think that product centric thinking is one of the things that has been missing uh, when we typically think about governance and MakerDAO. Of course, we already have um, a number of software platforms that are really essential to running our governance processes. Without the forum that we're using every day, without the voting portal, it uh, would be completely impossible to do MakerDAO governance. But um, we really want to think about the whole of decentralized operations, including um, coordination between core units, the execution of the roadmaps, et cetera, et cetera, um, as, a, as a, yeah, an end-to-end -end product that really um, offers the full functionality. Because today there are bits and pieces, but uh, other bits and pieces may still be missing. And why is it useful to use to build a product uh, instead of just um, agree on process and then implement the process manually. Well, instead of arguing about the process all the time, um, the kind of forum threads that we see a lot of, uh, many of these discussions, they end up uh, going nowhere in the end. And they might be very interesting and they might be very well thought through. But um, yeah, we, we just keep getting stuck in this um, this point of uh, arguing about the process. And instead, we could be developing with all that time that we put in that, we could be developing actual product features that um, others can then use. Using a product feature is like using a process on autopilot. So um, instead of getting lost in the forums and all these discussions, also a lot of the reporting that is done on the forums, we could also bring that uh, more tailored information serving to different audiences on a product platform. So for example, when a new version uh, of some software is released, then we might have a place for that in the product. And if you are only interested in product releases, you wouldn't have to, pl to plow through the entire forum, but just go to the specific section of the product. The interesting thing is that the end game plan also uh, supports this. And um, Rune himself recognizes that software can be a very powerful tool to um, to uh, fix the uh, the decentralized operations of MakerDAO, and um, yeah, he uh, he expressed that through the Universal DAO toolkit that is part of the endgame proposal that uh, he is pitching. So we would still need, on top of that, software can't solve everything. Uh, we would still need support services to help core units adopt these new practices. For example, uh, we have been doing a bit of that with uh, the budget reporting. You will be aware that we um, launched the first version of the expenses dashboard a while ago. And um, the last couple of weeks, we've been very busy uh, supporting core units with the change management. So going through this process of changing the practices that they were, uh, were using and to yeah, get into this new practice of uh, budget reporting in a way that makes it immediately available on that software platform. So we want to continue supporting the uh, contributors with uh, the change management and also yeah, support them with the, the leftover tasks that cannot be automated. As I mentioned, SES and like-minded core units, we are planning to form this decentralized operations cluster. Um, would be that software platform that we uh, would be offering for DAO governance, coordination, and execution, and uh, including also the services to host, for example, the necessary infrastructure, because if we develop the software, we probably want to get it and keep it up and running. And um, as I mentioned, help the stakeholders with uh, implementation. So practically speaking, there are already a number of activities that we're planning to do to help with that. Um, very soon, it will be DEF CON in uh, Bogota. So that's uh, October 5th until the 15th when uh, SES will be uh, present there. And that is the same time when the end game, end game polls will be up for voting. And the results will, I think, pretty quickly become clear whether the MIPS will make it or not. And assuming they do, um, we can already have a number of preliminary discussions with MetaDAO facilitator candidates. Many of them will be there in person at DEF CON, so always helps to be uh, there in person and be in the same room. And, but um, most importantly, we plan to uh, organize an additional offsite with workshops after DEF CON. The timing isn't quite decided yet, but we think it will be in November, the first half of November. 
And um, yeah, we would use that offsite with workshops to um, do a number of very needed things to uh, to move things towards execution. So especially we want to better define the deal that exists or that will exist between the metadata and maker core. A lot of uh, a lot of documentation has already been released about it, but still a lot of questions remain. And currently it's not enough, I think, for metadata facilitator candidates to actually commit to the metadata facilitator role. One other thing is that the role and responsibilities of those metadata facilitators are actually um, still very hazy. So in general terms, it's known what they would be responsible for, but what it would look like in practice is still very much up for debate. And that too needs to be clarified before people can meaningfully commit to it. So we want to help then the facilitator candidates to develop and document their business plan because metadata are supposed to be run as businesses. And then to help the facilitator candidates also to define in um, a little bit more detail a roadmap for the projects that they might be proposing. Runa is also supporting this initiative and he will participate as the author of the endgame MIPS. So our intended income outcome here is to uh, clarify things to the point where the facilitator candidates can indeed commit to the role, um, clarify it to the point where they can involve their teams because many of the uh, contributors are asking a lot of questions, especially uh, to the people who, uh, who are candidate to become a metadata facilitator and very often they don't have the answers. And of course, then um, we want to uh, report back to the community so that there is some overview of what is happening and um, yeah, that everyone can better understand uh, what a transition towards the metadata uh, may look like. So um, the, uh, the effort will be supported, as I mentioned, with um, the philosophy of trying to prefer uh, software and uh, automation over process. And the one example I want to give about uh, how we can do this in a very, um, a very iterative way. So not with big changes at one, uh, at one time, but um, from the situation where we are today, evolve into the new situation. Um, one, this uh, one example is project-based budgeting. So project-based budgeting, really what it would mean is that we would be turning core units into consultancy businesses. And that's, it's quite doable. It's a very well-known and well-understood business model, but we need to be thoughtful about it, how we go about it and um, do things uh, in little steps. So uh, real value um, is only produced when delivering an integrated solution. So not just separate software components, but the real product. Uh, this uh, applies to our own decentralized operations platform, but just as well, and more importantly, to the uh, other products and services that Maker is offering. So uh, software alone is not enough. You need the marketing, you need the support to succeed. And um, this is a construction error in Maker today because delegates and MPR holders, they approve team budgets, which is basically paying for people's salaries or compensation. Um, but these core units, they deliver only pieces of the integrated solutions and they are only responsible for their own uh, part of it. And no one really is responsible for integrating the pieces. So if you want to onboard collateral, it requires a lot of um, coordination and work between core units. And when the core units don't agree on the approach, then things just get stuck because there is no authority that can say, um, yeah, which... Uh, which decision to make if uh, two core units disagree. So a better way of working would be for delegates and MPR holders to approve those integrated solutions. Uh, so the, the projects that uh, we have been talking about and um, the party proposing the solution is then responsible for the end-to-end -end delivery. So these projects, as opposed to um, MIP39s, these projects, they, they, they have a value in their own right. When they're delivered, we have delivered something of value. The responsibility then comes with the authority of the full project budget. And that is, uh, I think, one of the things that is currently um, misconstructed in the, the structure of the, the DAO today. So really, as I mentioned, this is a consultancy business selling project, and this is a very well understood business model. The way that we can evolve today's budget structure um, in a gradual way, for example, 
would be to recognize that uh, even in the future when we do project-based budgeting that there might always be um, a part of the budget that remains that you can you can call it the retention budget which covers things that are not really part of any particular project for example they are the costs to prepare the proposals for the projects because if we want to make good proposals that will take a lot of time to do that properly um, we need to do estimations and things like that so uh, quite a lot of time goes into it we need to keep the infrastructure running once the project is finished as i said we probably want to keep everything up and running so uh, we need the, the running costs of uh, those infrastructure covered and we have other overhead costs so for example um, training, sending people to events, et cetera, et cetera. But today, um, everything in a sense is a retention budget and the projects they're delivered for free because that's more or less what it means when we approve a MIP-40, the, the budget is a retention budget and the projects are delivered for free. So instead we could gradually evolve towards a situation where um, the retention budget or the retention part of the budget is shrinking and uh, the core units start to uh, uh, define separate budgets for the projects that they're delivering and um, this is very much the same thing as once again a consultancy business working on a project basis they need to they know that they have billable hours non-billable hours and that they need to cover the one with the other so uh, this is a similar structure how can we do this in a um, gradual way so we can first start to provide the tools to report on project budgets this is already in progress i mentioned our expenses dashboard um, Today, it is structured in a way that it uh, reports on the retention budget, but um, by adding new features with every release, we can um, piece by piece add the functionality to start allocating budget to um, define projects and then move from there. So while well, we could provide indeed a feature then to prepare these project proposals and estimate the cost, help also the core members to um, do those estimations because even though the business model is well understood not everyone is an expert in this and we need to recognize that and um, yeah then as a next step we could add a voting interface to prioritize the projects based within a specific budget cap and then um, we have reformed our uh, budgeting practice and make it out towards something that is much more compatible with the end game plan to uh, make the point again, so core activities of a business like that, it would require to successfully hire and manage people, um, conduct the necessary market research to make sure that you're offering products, uh, projects and products that are actually, there is demand for. Um, you need to make these project proposals, define the deliverables, uh, estimate the cost at a safety margin to cover uh, unexpected costs. Um, yeah, we need to properly probably separate mandatory components from optional components, et cetera, et cetera. So these are all activities that uh, not every um, individual in the DAO may be an expert in. And um, this is again where software can help because software makes it much easier to um, do these kind of activities as it takes you by the hand. The implementation too, you need to organize the actual work. You need to keep track of the uh, time that was worked and report on the real cost of the project, see how close it is to the estimate, and then the uh, work needs to be delivered. This may seem obvious, but um, all of these parts are actually to a certain extent failing today. For example, delivering the work uh, today is done by a forum post most of the time. But um, yeah, if uh, I were to ask you where you can find, for example, the software that was delivered by project like uh, core unit X or Y, then you would probably not know where to look. And uh, these are the kind of things that we need to get right. We need to get the details right, and then we can make it work. So yeah, not all those contributors in an open organization may have all the prior experience they need to run this kind of business. And uh, once again, this is where we can help. Um, the software that we've built today already helps core unit facilitators uh, to structure their budgets. and um, yeah, we, we are basically building an app to make it simple. Um, we can start, for example, by grouping the budget categories by uh, project. We already, in fact, have that feature in the pipeline. 
um, we can then uh, add additional interfaces that allow core unit facilitators uh, and then later MetaDAO facilitators to propose budgets in the right way. Um, for example, not just describe the deliverables, but give them an interface that can help them with making these estimates, adding the right margins, and um, keep all that uh, transparent, but at the same time, uh, respect the, the privacy of um, the people working on it. And this is these are all things that software can do. Um, the, the good thing is that uh, we don't need to go around anymore and train everyone to use and follow best practices because the software enforces these best practices. They are embedded in it. And um, if you still, uh, if you're still wondering like uh, if software can really be that powerful, of course, examples are everywhere around us. Uh, think about starting a, a taxi company before Uber, think about starting a, um, a, a bed and breakfast before Airbnb. Uh, think about collaborating as developers, software developers before GitHub or think about selling indie games before Steam. Um, these are all platforms that have demonstrated that software, good software can actually um, enable an entire new industry. So um, we definitely believe that this is possible for uh, open decentralized organizations as well, which are a very new form of industry. And uh, yeah, so in conclusion, instead of learning the job the hard way, you can simply create an account and start using the software. And this is the kind of user experience that we'd like to uh, uh, deliver in the future for um, uh, maker that participants and the metadata and uh, for maker core. So that was it for my presentation. I'm very happy to start the discussion now. Nice. Uh, again, just a reminder to anyone that uh, that wants to hop on the mic, um, let us know and we can we can see what we do with that. Uh, we, yeah, team has a good question about uh, cost. I don't know, team, if you want to make your point. Uh, yeah, I just had to un unmute. Um, I would want to prioritize patents. I think he has more upvotes, but um, <laughs> they're both in a similar vein. The first one is uh, consultancy is normally also more expensive, right? Because people have less job security than salary. So, um, you know, I don't know if there's a solution to this. I think in inherently if we're changing the way that the DAO does work and we are paying for value, we just have to be prepared, especially everywhere. I, I was going to say, especially for delegates, but, you know, consultants tend to charge rates. Um, to argue against myself, you would say, well, what you would hope for is a marketplace of teams trying to compete for that work, right? That's the eventual hope. And so that was where I was going to kind of go. Are we hoping to see more than just single teams coming in and like more diversity of like options on projects or what's the thinking that way? Yeah. So I do think it uh, goes back to properly structuring the consultancy business um, on, because working with, um, uh, with subcontractors is a part of that. Uh, so if you think about it, the, what you just mentioned that there is less job security, if you, if you work as a contractor, therefore it's going to be more expensive. That is exactly the, the gap that, uh, the consultancy business bridges. So on the one hand, they have uh, typically employees who need to get their monthly salaries paid. They have these, these overhead costs that they need to cover with the uh, profits from their projects. And by structuring that, uh, that process internally and providing the software to help uh, Metado facilitators to um, yeah, to do that properly, um, you yeah you can build a, a well functioning um, consultancy business that would include having a good overview of what the cost is, uh, what the different cost components are, not just the yeah the, the everything as I mentioned as a retention cost, but uh, per project, and when a project didn't seem to deliver the value that. Uh, you would expect for the cost that it, uh, that it had, then you can actually start to look into, okay, well, what went wrong here? Was it, was it the software development that took? 
was it um you know was there on top of the software development a whole lot of uh, uh overhead costs that you wouldn't expect um is it uh, the quality of the software that really uh wasn't up to the standards that we expect so these kind of questions you can only start asking if um if the right information is available and uh, the whole point of the software would be to make sure that that is the case and to help uh core unit facilitators or metadata facilitators or the contributors uh, from the individual to the team leads um to make sure to to make it easy for them to uh, to yeah, keep this uh, this data up to date so to, to go back to your question like would we expect to see um more competition uh, i think in in two ways there will be uh yeah there will be great benefit to maker one way is, is the, the starting point which is you propose a project so you really focus on the value that you can deliver otherwise you won't be able to sell your project in the first place that already is a big win and there may be competing uh, project proposals and if there are two competing proposals we may ask ourselves why, why why is this one so much cheaper than the other one maybe there are differences in the quality maybe one doesn't get the requirements right is including stuff that we don't really need um or maybe one is just making uh, an unrealistic offer so that's that's already one layer where you can uh, much better play out uh, competition between different suppliers and then the second way is um is is the supplier of the um are the suppliers of the uh the yeah the party who proposes the project um so if that will be the method that facilitator then um that facilitator may be working with uh, multiple suppliers and um yeah it will be uh if they use the same reporting standards which is expected then we will be able to see uh what the difference is in cost and the difference in quality and then that's the kind of information you need to to then look for a better alternative if it turns out that uh, this isn't actually the best offer that we can get and um, yeah all these elements today are very 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 difficult in maker now uh, because the whole thing is just structured very differently with the mip 40 you just you just pay the budget for a team and then you hope for the best uh, and as i mentioned there isn't even anyone responsible for delivering the integrated solution so looking at that that way it's uh it's kind of amazing we still made it work to the extent that we we made it work uh, so uh, i i do think a different structure might be much much more efficient and indeed uh yeah um create more competition bros you want to make your point about uh, the evaluation committee yeah thanks um so basically my question was do you envision like an evaluation committee being necessary as as kind of the back end of the project based budgeting um and and kind of where that question comes from i guess is one similarity i could possibly see between the current system and 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 what's being proposed here is that after the work is being delivered it's kind of like well either it's acceptable or, or unacceptable right and if it's unacceptable maybe you know you'll you'll face actions uh, if it's acceptable uh you know, maybe it's not great, but it's it's good enough, and it doesn't come up again till till far later. That maybe you could have done X, Y, and Z better. Um, in particular, this has been feedback from from some of these calls uh, from SES, right? In terms of uh, having a, a different option when proposals were were onboarded, uh, that that comes to mind of just like, hey, if it's only yes or no, you know, it, it's really hard to to get the feedback of okay, but you know, was was this valued? Could I have done better? Yeah, um, when I when I think about the role of evaluation committees, the the closest thing that we have in pushing for is an auditor function uh, within MakerDAO, and and that never happened. And I I definitely believe it's uh, is necessary um, because you need a, you need an expert to review an expert's work. Uh, if you are not familiar with software development, you cannot tell the difference, probably, especially not in the first iteration, between good quality software that might be more expensive versus, um, yeah, cheap software that isn't scalable or maintainable or has safety issues. So um, 
that kind of review quality control is definitely needed. And um, yeah, another thing I've, I've called out many times in the forum is um, that outsourcing in itself isn't isn't easy either. Like it can horribly, horribly fail um, if indeed you yeah you fail to to have someone on the side of the customer that can properly manage the relationship and do that quality control check. Uh, then um, you're just a hostage to your supplier, and um, you you will need to just believe what they tell you. Um, so yes, I I definitely believe that. Uh, some kind of quality control on the side of maker core who will be the customer is needed um and again i think that the software can tremendously help with that so uh, pointing at examples like github um yeah th there are very specific examples uh that i would say the, the transparency is uh, is the most obvious one like everything is so much more transparent that it makes it possible in the first place to look into uh, what is delivered and for example check out the unit tests or not um, you can download the project you can run it you can see what the cover test coverage is etc etc um, you can see if there is documentation available and you can see you can look into the, the structure of the code whether it's properly structured or not and um, you can go even further like they do at uh, github where they 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 start um, yeah they have like features that have Automated checking if some vulnerability is um, uh, is present, for example. So I, I think that the two go hand in hand. Like the software cannot replace the uh, person doing the quality control check, but it can help tremendously to surface the right information to make it very easy to do a quality control check. And I think we need to aim for um, for a combination of the two. Nice, and I'm, I'm guessing part of we're also a bit um, like considering having projects that span across several core units, uh, like a multi-core unit uh, project. In that case, I'm 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 not sure how you see the software being like an orchestration tool, uh, or if it's not, and they and each project needs to find their own tools to to manage that. And another another thing that I was thinking about is how do you make sure that there's a, there's someone accountable, right? And that the DAO doesn't need to fall into this micromanagement. And an example could be if you have, I don't know, growth and gov alpha and I don't know, SES working on something, uh, it could be uh, that, I don't know, we couldn't deliver because growth didn't say something or, and they say, no, no, we actually did. And then you get into this you know, micromanagement or, or, or we go back to the politics. So how do we make sure that that doesn't happen here? Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think that's one area where our, our understanding of decentralization that works is, um, is progressing. Uh, I think at one point in the beginning, we uh, kind of opposed the idea that there would be a single, um, a single person. It, we, I guess that the opposition is against like a single person having the authority to, to make decisions. Um, but uh, you, you're asking about responsibility and the, the, the thing is that the two always go hand in hand. So if you are responsible for something, well, you would be very stupid to make yourself responsible for something that you, you can't control, right? Um, so if you are held responsible, then you need to have the authority to, uh, to make the, the necessary decisions to improve and to live up to that responsibility. So that means, um, and, and this is also, this is the structure that is being proposed that um, these project proposals, it's the same party that proposes the project uh, who should be responsible for delivering it and also have the authority to, um, to make decisions such as where the budget goes. And uh, that's the point where today just, it just ends in a deadlock because you have two core units disagreeing on something and they each go their own way and one, yeah, one builds a tire and the other builds uh, a car that and the tire doesn't fit and it's no one's responsibility right um so so that that needs to that is like a structural change and software is not going to change that like if you if you have a mismatch between responsibility and authority it's not it's not going to work but the, the the structure does uh does have a good match there so in the new structure the same person who is responsible for delivering the result also has the authority to 
um, to allocate the budget. And then um, still, of course, like multiple teams, multiple parties need to collaborate and coordinate to deliver the, uh, the product. Um, and that's where the, the software can help tremendously because if you, if you think about what you need to do manually to um, write up a good uh, project proposal and you know that you do depend on others delivering work. So you need to go to all these different parties. They need to ask them what the work will be. Uh, they need to estimate the work. You need to include the estimates in your uh, total estimate. You need to make sure the necessary safety margins are added. And then you need to propose a project for a, a, a price that is still um, that, that is still attractive, but um, that doesn't run too much of a risk of uh, some some supplier like uh, falling out and uh, and 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 blocking the whole thing. And and that's that is a coordination problem where software can help tremendously. So, for example, we can really systematize the way that um, you create this, the project proposal. And um, yeah, you, you can like uh, you could define the tasks uh, that would be done by the different um, by the different parties who are collaborating. They could e each use the, the software to enter their estimates. And um, yeah, you can you can keep the overview and instead of like chasing people all the time through emails, um, make the thing just uh, happen through the software. And it, it really saves a lot of time if you have the right tool available there. And I think that's where it can make a difference. So Ori, I was on mute. Uh, yeah, no, that's that's a that's a good point. Uh, I don't know, Nadia, if you wanted to follow up on that or. Yeah, sure. Uh, so um, I think the software is a great tool that uh, will help us to think about projects instead um, instead of a mandate. That, that is awesome. Maybe the problem with uh, the MIP structure is that it, uh, it uh, gives us a lot of freedom, so we don't have a standard, and uh, it's it's hard to like then uh, follow on all the mandates and the results that we're expecting. But uh, I also think that with some exceptions, if, if I think about the projects that Maker needs, all are like, some sort of cross car unit initiatives. So for example, onboarding a new collateral that uh, governance approved, right? You think different roles to like do that properly. In that case, this will change the way how core units are structured because I don't think that it is like, it will be problematic also to coordinate or as Juan said, to orchestrate between different core units if I'm the face of a project. I would prefer to like hire my own team and just like do collateral onboarding uh, mm -hmm. and present projects to onboard collaterals. So are we like, I think that this will also change. Like it's not just, it's not that we are talking about a new tool, it's that we are also talking that core units are, exist today will like disappear because we will have to think more in terms of offering a uh, end-to-end service, right? Absolutely. Yeah, but I agree with, with everything you said. So um, uh, that's what I what I answered the, the last question with. So software alone is, is not going to fix it. You need, for example, to have to combine whoever is responsible for the end result needs to have the authority to determine the outcome. Um, meaning that exactly what you said, if there's some core unit uh, you, you don't find it easy to work with, you would rather hire some external uh, party to do the work because it's just, it works better. Um, well, that's, I think, the, the big change in the, in the structure that is proposed is that the metadata facilitator would exactly have that kind of authority, right? Mm -hmm. um, because that's where the control of the budget would be. Um, but still, you need to, whoever you work with, you need to collect the right information to, um, to make a, a project proposal that, um, yeah, that is a good proposal in, in the sense that you will be able to deliver what you're 
um, what your deliverables are describing, and you will need to, be, to do it within the budget and within maybe also within the timeline even. So, and that is not easy. Like that is the art of uh, doing good project management. Yeah. Um, so and that's where the tool can help. But um, I, I totally agree with you. If there is a mismatch, if you have to work with a party that uh, that that doesn't deliver good quality work, and then afterwards you are responsible for the end result, yeah, that's never going to work. So, um, so, so, yeah, the, the the most important structural difference I think between today's situation and the new MetaDevs is that um, the MetaDev facilitator would be in that situation where they they have full authority over the budget and how it is spent. And as a result, they can take up responsibility over the end result of what is delivered. That's that's interesting because then this is not a like a like this is more thought not for core units but for ecosystem actors because like uh, an ecosystem actor like as as I understand it it is capable to offer this end to end service. Uh, or maybe like you can present a proposal and hire different ecosystem actors, but but I think it's it is interesting for us like core units to start like thinking that core units as they are will disappear and we have to think like in other types of organizations to offer different things to make her. Yeah, but um, I don't believe there is like a fundamental difference between an external supplier and an internal team, right? So if you are working as a metadata facilitator, um, you, you may well have an internal team that works very well and you're, you, know, you, you have worked with them in the past, uh, you, you already know how to work together. Um, definitely, if, if indeed the software supports you in that, it's just it's more an efficient way of working. Um, and then the, what, yeah, the confusion around core units is that the term would still exist, but it would mean something very different. But let's say a metadata team, internal team, um, it's still perfectly possible, right? Uh, in fact, I, I think it will allow the metadata facilitator to make that choice whether to outsource something or do it internally. The same choice that any any business is, uh, is confronted with, right? So that it's always a very important choice and there are pros and cons. Um, so I don't believe everything will be done by external teams. I, uh, on, on the contrary, I think um, we will still have these internal teams, but the rules of the games will be different um, because there will be one party or one person of it, uh, responsible for the end result and have the authority to allocate the budget. So if an internal team isn't aligned with the vision of what is being offered to, to make it, uh, well, now you have a, the possibility to say, well, yeah, <laughs> uh, maybe you shouldn't be working for us because we're not thinking the right thing, the same thing. And um, you have that situation today all the time between core units who have independently been voted in without any indication whether they're aligned on how to do or deliver things. So, um, and today there is no resolution to that situation because it's up to the delegates to then clean up the mess and that's, that is not working. Cool, thanks. Rosa, I believe you had a comment or? Yeah, comment question, just tee you off, I guess, really, <laughs> louder. Uh, but there is this, uh, uh, it feels old, I have no idea when exactly it was uh, pitched, uh, idea from SES with uh, funding kind of being decided by by uh, delegation parties, right? The fact that you would attract NKR to your delegation and then you would send it out um, kind of based on the things your, your delegation team thinks is important. Um, and I kind of wonder if you see a, a possibility for renaissance in that with the in-game plan and particularly as it relates to like um, quality control for, for the projects and, and the question I asked earlier. Yeah, I, I think we're, um we're solving the same problem uh, with slightly different but similar tools. Um, indeed, having a, a group of delegates who have their own 
budget that they can decide over uh, as a group and the group, or let, let's say, because the group needs to be aligned, right? If the group isn't aligned, they should split up in two groups. So it's it's one one party with one vision, one align, one uh, direction they want to go. Um, if they can control that budget, then they can say, well, your core unit is doing something that um, is in line with my vision and the other core unit isn't really following our our philosophy or something, then they could allocate that budget to to some external party to do the work of that non-aligned core unit instead. So you have the same mechanism. Um, it's the ability to to determine a certain direction um, and to to remove elements that are blocking the the delivery of of uh, of what what actually is valuable for maker that. And the problem is, if you don't, if you don't have that group of delegates who can, who has that authority, and you don't have like a metadata facilitator who who is responsible for the end result, you end up in a situation where it's just core units telling each other, well, I disagree with you, and I disagree with you, and we're going to do our thing, and the rest isn't our responsibility, and the thing that doesn't get delivered. And this isn't, I, I don't want to make this sound malicious, right? Like. Uh, there might be very good reason for disagreement, and um, maybe they're both right. But the, the 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 practical fact is just that if you're not aligned on how you're going to build the solution and you each do your thing, well, then the solution is not going to work. So, um, and both approaches might have been um, might have been possible, but uh, you need to to pick one and, and stick with it. And uh, that's what what isn't possible today because there's no mechanism. To uh, to resolve these uh, these differences of opinion. Thanks. Sam. That was great. Uh, Ralph, you had a couple comments regarding the um, yeah, like deadlines and and setting. I don't know if you want to to comment on that. Yeah. Um, Milestones. So when I look at um, Airbnb or Uber, I have a very clearly defined um product that the the people on the platform are offering right it's like uh, drive people from a to b or host people in a uh, room apartment house but then when you look at the dao there's a huge variety of potential offerings so i think i think it's great to 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 um, I'm, I'm totally down with project-based financing um and i just think that the platform we we'll need a lot of iterations to really classify that. Like in, in a previous company, we we used the German government. The, the German government government has a, a project-based financing <laughs> portal and it's hell, you know. So I'm sure you can build better stuff, but I think there are some really hard problems in defining deliverables well. And there's a huge incentive by malicious. Uh, I'm sure you know there's this malicious way of proposing something that you know you can't deliver for cheap and then charging for change requests. And this is the name of the game basically everywhere where this kind of platform is used. Like, how do you, you go, how are you going to address that? Yeah, I, I think that's an excellent uh, comment. Um, so it's it's definitely true because another way to describe the whole thing is to say well it's just an ERP uh, implementation right like uh, it's just uh, it's just a, a software platform to uh, to run the operations of the company and and we'll, yeah that has been done since the beginning of software and uh, anyone who has any experience with ERP projects knows that uh, they're not easy to get right. Um, and I think that the difference here is exactly, so first of all, we're, um, we shouldn't confuse two things. So one, we have our operational platform Two, we have, we have the, the products that we're building by using the operational platform and the, the, the problem kind of exists on, on both levels, right? But we shouldn't, we shouldn't confuse it. Um, so. Yeah, I, I think uh, 
I do think that the environment that where we work that we work in is um, is is a better environment to build a good product than um, internally in some company. And I think that's where, and really that's where we need to go is where, you know, we, we need to play out the strengths of decentralization and openness rather than be hindered by the, by the challenges all the time. Um, and I, I think that, um, so Uber and Airbnb, they, part of the reason why they work so well, I think is because they're in the open. Um, anyone, uh, they're of course the private companies, but that's not what I mean anyone can join the platform like it's not an internal erp software for some taxi company or it's not an internal erp software for um, some hotel chain it's an open platform and when you create an open platform like that you really have to think about what your users want and how you get how you do good product development i think one issue with with these kind of internal projects uh, as opposed to this, is that, um, yeah, they're just not very good. This is just not very good product development. Um, it's internal politics that decide for the features, for example, rather than what the user wants. Um, so these kind of things. So it, it starts with good product development. And I think we're in an environment where um, we can, yeah, we can do that. Uh, you mentioned another thing you said, well, we'll need many iterations. And, and I, I couldn't agree more. Um, that is not coincidentally also one of the differences very often between internal software and uh, software that exists in the open is that software that exists in the open, you can't, you just can't afford to work two years in something and then release it and then realize, oh, we haven't really built something that people actually want to use. Um, and then you slap a policy on top of it that says that everyone is, uh, it's mandatory to use it, right? And then, uh, and then everyone is using that software and that's terrible. Um, so that's not, it, that's just very bad product, uh, product development. And, um, we should do the opposite. We need to, to iterate. Um, and I think that's, uh, for example, what we're doing with, uh, with the expenses dashboard. The reason why it's called the expenses dashboard, which seems very uh, limited in scope, is because we didn't want to wait with the release until, yeah, we added also roadmaps and projects, and we have a lot of ideas about how these features should be developed. But we're going to test these ideas every step of the road. Um, so good product development starts with validating your assumptions every step of the road and measuring it and then finding the right uh, recipe that really works well. And um, so, yes, it's it's not always easy to do, but I do think uh, for that, we have the experience in how to do that. And um, two, we, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's just in the, in the environment that we're working in, uh, it will very much drive us towards that, I think. Um, so that being said, I, I'm not saying that, um, so for example, let's take the, the issue that you, that you point out, um, uh, the, the scope of a project is defined in such a way that it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's rather, it's restrictive. And then, then you, you launch something that doesn't really work. And then you start charging for change requests. Um, that is really where the openness and the competition needs to play. Because if, if that happens, like a group is doing that, um, first iteration, okay, well, it's the first version, second iteration, uh, it improved a bit, but it's kind of expensive. Uh, third iteration, fourth iteration, turns out we're not building a successful product for a good, for a good price. Um, so. The rules that we set, the, the fact that the iterations need to be small, uh, what is the size of the project? For example, the uh, one of the, the conditions that we defined in the beginning was to, to set like a maximum size on the budget, which would really force the teams to think in small iterations that in themselves deliver value. And small iterations, they mean that you can, you have time to react. Like if, if there's a, um, if there's a group that delivers a, a project 
twice, three times in a row, and it's uh, it's really not working. Well, uh, not much is lost. Like uh, after three iterations, you can still shut it down and, and do something else. Um, so yeah, but we need to get the details right. And I think uh, what you're pointing out are just they're the, the typical challenges and intricacies of of building good software products. Um, and uh, yeah, we need to get the details right to uh, to deal with those. But I do think it's definitely possible, um, and we we have examples of uh, where it was very successful. Right? Thank you, Raf, for that. Robert, I don't know if you had a comment. Yeah, just to uh, can you hear me? First off, yes. Okay, so so just as a comment to. Know, there's a lot of ground you guys have covered, and I really appreciate the the time and energy everyone's put into this because this is uh, this is an approach that I that I align with, just because of um, my background and work I've done in the past, and trying to and, and from the day one from CES trying to figure out like how do we make ourselves a real business? Because um, I always knew the core unit model would change, and I always knew that there would be more accountability, and then. Each of these entities, I'll just call them, would need to stand on their own somehow. So my mind's been here for a while, and I really believe that the project-based approach can go a long way to getting us there. Um, this is the most um, detail and practical implementation that I've seen in a very long time, and and I wasn't able to attend the first part of the call, so I, I, I'll, I'll go back and watch it as it relates to the integration with MetaDAOs and how that might work. Um, one of the challenges that I'm having is, is that there are a lot of rules and constraints that, that are around the metadows and I just want to run a business and I want to run a profitable business and I want to understand my goals and objectives and I want to deliver upon those and I want to be paid appropriately. That that's what I want to do at the end of the day. And I think a really hard time understanding how I can do that inside of the, the end game plan, at least the way it's been presented. Um, and, and so, you know, one of the areas that we also struggle with is, is that um, we do a lot of work today in this project-based model in the way of implementation, especially as it relates to real-world assets. And everything is one-off today. We're looking to operationalize that, and we have been for some time, and we're going to be putting some um, educational material out in the, in the form to, to help start to educate the community on what we think is needed in these areas. But for me right now, it, it, it would be very challenging for me to put a cost around a specific project unless we have past prior experience. And then even on top of that, there are always nuances to the model. But then there are also ongoing, what we believe to be ongoing management costs as it relates to the collateral. I think some of these will be handled by uh, MetaDAOs that adopt vaults, but there's also an opportunity here for this plug and play model that Rune talks about. And I don't know really how that fits in to the overall project based budgeting. You know, is that something we just fund on our own? Do we find external funding sources to be able to build those products and add them back to the DAO? I was kind of curious on, on any thoughts that you have a about how this integrates into the meta DAOs and how it's a partner with that. And then B, you know, the, the, the models that we might construct initially in the way of funding. So is there a quote unquote guarantee for a period of time? And then we start to get funded by projects, but those projects have to be funded, at least the way I understand it, by MetaDAOs. And I continue to ask the question, how do we get DAI into the MetaDAOs to pay for services that they, those MetaDAOs need to procure to get their jobs done? I know it's a lot of information, but I'll just I'll, I'll pause there. Yes, uh, wanna wanna organize that call, Robert. Uh, it's, uh, it's it's a lot. Um, no, but I, and I don't have all the answers, right? The what we are committing to is basically is an iterative approach that can evolve from the current situation to um, one that that takes more the shape of what the plan is with the method Um And and so one element to to pick the first one that. Uh, you so the, the, this uh, the issue of running costs, right? Um, that's um, 
there's, there's one that we already recognized. And uh, I don't know if you already were on the call when I um, presented the slide of this transition, but in a way that Koreans today, you can, you can um, uh, see them as like uh, uh, on, a, on a budgetary cost basis, uh, it's it's a 100% retention cost, and then the work that they do is free. Um, you can shift that gradually towards a model where the retention cost, which covers the running costs of, for example, infrastructure, was on the list, um, and and it it starts to to just like shrink that part of the budget. Also, very comparable to uh, to opex and capex. So. Um, and and you start just introducing these projects for new feature development for the new things that you do um and as i mentioned there are a lot of details that we need to get right so for example uh one way and this is is one of those challenges that, that uh, rafael was also talking about um yeah well you know the business model of selling you a very cheap printer and then uh the the maintenance cost is huge so um you could do the same with, with projects like uh, uh, could be that a, a project that looks like a nice new feature it just it creates a huge maintenance cost that um, that will kill you in the long run so we need to look at those details and we need to make sure that that is yeah that, that is surfaced those kind of issues um, there is another one that you mentioned which is or at least reading between the lines, I think uh, it's part of it is that there needs to be like a long term vision. And if you're you're evaluating a project, it needs to be evaluated in in the context of that long term vision, because sometimes, yeah, you need to just start building things up and then um, a project, I think, should in itself have value that it, that it already adds. But at the same time, it might be too costly if you if you don't fit it within a broader strategy and the broader strategy might bring you long-term success. So how do we deal with that? And those are the kind of details that we need to get right. Um, that one, to take that example, uh, the, the, the feature for creating projects that we had in mind would combine the two. So you would, you would actually, you would define your long-term vision, but the long-term vision on the one hand, it, it creates a lot of, um, like it's it's important to like uh, create that uh, you know that potential success vision and and understand these individual iterations where they're going to. So it has to be part of that. Um, but at the same time, as you mentioned, it's it's very difficult if it's a long term vision and it's like a very big deliverable to guarantee the results for a fixed cost. It's it's just too far away and complicated. So um, the feature that we had in mind, it combines the two. It, it gives you the opportunity to um, define that long-term vision following a certain format so that it's not a 50-page document, but like, you know, boil it down to a half page so that people can actually grasp it. Um, and so, and then the projects are proposed on that trajectory towards that long-term vision. So I think your, the success of getting projects approved will, to a large extent, um, depend on, on the group's ability to, to clearly paint that long-term vision in a way that, um, that, is, that people can understand, and then uh, show that the projects that you're offering move the needle closer towards that long-term vision. There have been a lot of discussions about KPIs. The KPIs, they should be part of the long-term vision. Um, and, and it should be clear like how the projects that you're delivering are moving the needle on those KPIs. And I think uh, those kind of mechanisms, they, uh, they're not like a silver bullet. Like it, It's not going to make those challenges that you're pointing out, which are quite fundamental, go away. But um, I believe that if we, if, we make, if we create a tool in the right way, we can get those details right and uh, and 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 uh, make it a good tool to deal with those challenges. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, Water. And I'll go back and look at the the earlier part of the presentation. Um, how do you plan to specifically integrate this in with the end game? And I'm I'm sure you've been talking to Rune about this, but this is to me this seems to be the practical piece of something that's implementable as we walk into this future. 
And, and I'm really challenged right now because, you know, there, there are a lot of rules around meta DAOs about what they can look like and what they can do and the roles and responsibilities, at least what I'm trying to understand. And I think that this model that you're presenting, we could take this model and this could be really the core of what we're trying to accomplish in moving into the end game. And of course, there are tokenomics that, that are around that. But this seems to be, to me, the alternative to what is being presented in the way of, you know, different types of meta DAOs and scopes and tribunals and councils and all sorts of stuff that I'm having a hard time to figure out how it all works together. So are, are you yeah. working closely with Rune on this for a, maybe we kind of veer it more this way than um, what I'm seeing currently? Yeah, so, so um, just as I believe in iterative product development, I believe in iterative implementation of something huge as the end game plan. And, and yes, we are trying to uh, provide a way in to, to evolve the structure that we have today uh, and move it closer towards the, the ideas and the philosophy of the end game plan, but at the same time, um, be very practical about it and, and go in, in little, with little baby steps, right? Uh, and I'm, uh, I, I think you probably weren't on the call when I presented the slide where um, uh, I can, I'll bring it up again in a moment, where um, uh, I laid out, so the, the timeline that we see is, uh, it's, it's first DEF CON now. During DEF CON, a lot of people will be in the same place and the, the end game plan will be up for a vote and it will become pretty clear pretty soon, I think, whether it will make it or not. Um, and we are assuming that it, it probably will. So we will uh, take the opportunity where everyone is together in Bogota to already start uh, these uh, preliminary talks. Specifically, um, we want to talk to those people who who feel that uh, you know they want to be a candidate for uh, for being a metadata facilitator. Um, but the important thing is we plan an offsite a little bit after that, probably first half of, of November. Uh, where we will work with these people very practically to um, identify the the uh, or clarify the the confusions that are currently uh, blocking people from really committing to the role. Uh, so we need to have a better understanding of what the metadata facilitator uh, facilitator's role and responsibilities exactly look like because there has been a lot of discussion about it, but nothing really uh, crystal clear. And, um, and you need that if you want to commit to a role like that. So uh, the other thing is that we need to understand better the deal between the MetaDAO and MakerDAO. Um, we need to help the MetaDAO facilitators then to, uh, to build, uh, to, to describe the business plan that they have in mind for their MetaDAO. And then, um, yeah, we need to, to communicate all that back to the community and to the, the teams, the contributors who might be part of that and who have a lot of questions, but um, don't get a lot of answers today. So that, that's, uh, that's our plan, to, um, to talk to people first in Bogota, then do the offsite with workshops, and then um, from that have, have something clear and simple uh, enough to start executing on. All right. Thank you, everyone, for participating in the discussion. Um, yeah, we've been recording for over an hour now, so it's probably a good time to to close it. I don't know, but if you have any last uh, comments or remarks. Yeah, over an hour is really long enough. That's my, my final remark. <laughs> Sounds good. Yes. Um, yeah, uh, so for any maker-related conversations, forum.makerdao.com. Uh, we are SES, Sustainable Ecosystem Scaling, SES.makerdao.network. And um, yeah, hopefully you know where to reach out if you have any questions or, or comments. Thank you everyone for joining. Thanks everyone, have a good weekend.